Hi, this is Mike with Rogue Media Network. As Texas opens back up, some of our shows have chosen to continue to record from remote locations. Some of our other shows have started recording in studio with very few people observing social distancing. Thanks for listening, and please be safe. This is Central Texas Living with Ann Harder. The Texas Sports Hall of Fame is the history of athletics in Texas. It's a popular tourist destination, and thankfully, it is back open. Joining me now, President and CEO Cooper Jones, and uh, how are things going back at the museum? And so great to be with you today. We're excited to be open. Uh, as so many people in town are, I think we're trying to balance uh, that mix of being socially responsible and responsible to not only our staff, but our guests, but at the same time itching to get back open and uh, allow the public to come and get out and safely come back to the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, something that they've been missing since really middle of March. Well, it is a popular destination because you've got the Southwest Sports Hall of uh, Conference Hall and you've got the Tennis Hall of Fame. You've got so many different aspects of Texas sports. You're right. And in 36,000 square feet, we've been able to accomplish a lot. And so whether it's Texas high school football, or as you mentioned, the Texas Tennis Hall of Fame, the Southwest Conference Gallery, there really is something for everyone that has a passion for that. And I think that's one of the things that we care most deeply about is the mission of protecting, promoting, and preserving sports in the state of Texas. We're the only one. Uh, You know, there are many different organizations that are quite worthy throughout the state. But similarities in each cities. Uh, What you won't find is another sports hall of fame across the state of Texas. We're also the oldest uh, throughout the country. In 1951, we were founded, so we're the oldest state sports hall of fame, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Well, let's talk about the history of it a little bit. It it didn't originate in Waco. It did not. This was a uh, discussion that Thad Johnson, one of the leading sports writers in the country in the mid-1950s, early 1950s, started uh, down around Galveston, I believe, is when those conversations started. And in the next year, they inducted the first class with Chris Speaker, one of the original baseball Hall of Famers going in. So that's a pretty strong uh, first person in. And I think that's actually been a great guiding light for the Hall of Fame going forward, is that we make sure that each and every year we're trying to hold ourselves to that high and lofty standard when we think about not just our museum, but our inductees as well. Now, your induction bank, but of course, it is a highlight of the year for a lot of people. And sadly... And didn't happen this past March, what, 28th it was set for? That's right. As so many things in our world have been turned upside down, we are an event-heavy organization. And that was one of those that very early on we were really excited about. The entire class was tremendous, but to be able to have Waco's own Robert Griffith III be a part of that was very exciting for us. And so, as you can imagine, now we've worked for the last year on the schedules for the March 28th. We've compacted a year worth of schedule planning into the last, really, 60 to 90 days. And so we're working really hard to have a date. We're very, very close to being able to reannounce, um, uh, to announce the rescheduled date for the 2020 induction. Bank. Oh, that gives me chills. That's I was that. almost at a point <laughs> where I could exciting. do it today, oh, but man. Uh, it would have been breaking news. It would have, it would have been breaking news here on Central Texas Living, the podcast. Yeah, it, which I'm all about that. That's great. But, but the fact that, you know, you have to coordinate so many different people's schedules. It's for us getting into this piece of it, you really, with the condensed time frame, became pretty stressful for us and trying to to deal with people, Adrian Beltrains in Los Angeles, and we were dealing with individuals that were in New York City, and all of a sudden, Zoom has become something that is now a daily part of our lives. Uh, I didn't know much about it before this pandemic hit, but now that is something that we're doing all the time, and so agents that are involved, families that are involved, it's really become, um, I wouldn't say stressful, but it's become a lot to try to coordinate all those schedules in a condensed time frame. We usually do this out over a year. We're doing this in 60 days now. And so we're finding out we can do some of these things when pressed. But I think for the Hall of Fame to make sure that as many of those inductees are able to be a part of the rescheduled banquet is really our focus. Well, it's not the only big uh, event you had planned. Um, The Sports Media Hall of Fame. Also, that induction set for May 30th. And you got Brad Sham, Randy Galloway, John McClain, Eric Nadell, Frank Gleiber. Shereen uh, Williams. Great, some yeah. great names there. And you know they're disappointed because I presume you're not going to have it on May 30th. We have postponed that as well and have a conference call at the end of the week to discuss whether we do that at the end of this year 
or if we push that into next year. And so it is been, this a first for this? It's 14 years since our first. The okay. inaugural one was as strong a class as we've probably ever had with yeah. Dan Jenkins and Vern Lundquist and Blackie yeah. Sherrod and Curtin Tips sure. and Frank Fallon yes. locally. Loved Frank. And, yeah. and one of the things that's unique is probably three to four members out of this class are actually on the Media Hall of Fame Selection Committee. It was awkward to get them to focus on each other. They all started looking at the others in the room and said, well, of course, John McClain needs to be in. And John McClain wouldn't say anything about himself, sure, no, but he'd look at not, Brad Sham. Yeah, he's like, Brad Sham, of course, he emcees everything you do. So, <laughs> And yeah. so it was unique. They were very humble about that yeah. and wanted to make sure that... Uh, they put some bylaws in place that we can only have this event every five years. They're okay. very much focused from the Media Hall of Fame perspective about making sure they never dilute that class. Well, let's talk about the fundraising aspect of it. Are these events designed to raise money for the Hall of Fame? And you're absolutely right. We are, as I mentioned a little earlier, an event-based organization. And so a significant portion of our revenues are driven out of these. When we have a disruption or have to reschedule some of these, that really puts um, that puts a tightness in our budget. And so uh, as so many people here locally and across the country have struggled over the last 90 days, we have as well. And thank goodness for some of the uh, things we've been able to do, generosity of our board members and donors. We had a very successful May 5th giving day. Mm -hmm. So that was exciting. That netted us a little over $21,000. We also were fortunate enough to be a part of the Small Business Administration's PPP program. And so locally here, that made a difference for us and allowed us to not have to lay off staff, to not to furlough staff, to be able to continue to keep the the operation ready and running so that when we were able to reopen, we were in a strong way. But the events are a big deal for us. If we aren't able to have those at the end of the year, um, it will cause significant significant strive for the organization. So we're moving forward planning as if we're going to be able to have those. Our next big one is June 19th and 20th. We've got the Bob Lilly, the 26th, the 27th annual. Oh, man. Bob I Lilly. remember the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Bob yeah. has been such a great friend yeah. to the organization, not only a Hall of Famer himself, both in the Southwest Conference and the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, but has lent his name um, and has volunteered so significantly for the Hall. And so to now be getting closer to 30 years with with Bob's namesake on, name, excuse me, on the Hall of Fame Celebrity Golf Tournament, we're thrilled about that. Starting to let individuals know that that tournament's still going on. We've got almost all of Saturday, the 20th full. And really? so Friday the 19th is starting to fill up now. Good. We've got about 20 celebrities. We anticipate we'll have another 10 to 15 of those that'll be coming out to play. Oh, like who? Tell me. Uh, Dan Pastorini out of Houston will be there. Elvin Bethay is going to be there. Obviously, Bob yeah. Lilly will be there. Um, I believe this will be one of our last years with, oh, goodness gracious, um, Lawrence Elkins, I believe, is going to make another appearance this year. So we've got several of our our longtime Hall of Fame supporters that are inductees uh, that are going to make another uh, trip this year to Waco and play with us at Cottonwood Creek Country Club. And what's unique is we've seen over the last couple of years a real influx of some of our newer um, Hall of Fame, not necessarily inductees, but those that have brought real fame and honor to Texas, uh, to sports in the state of Texas, like in Arthur Rhodes. That's somebody who's just started playing with us over the last couple of years. That's been very exciting. Scott Pesednik came back last year and played with us. Scott's going to be back again this year. And so that's a unique mix of people that 40, 50 years ago stopped playing and individuals who are just... 40 or 50 years old. And so that's unique for us. I think people that when you come need out, that. Well, you do. Yeah. You, you know, you've got individuals that, that may not know who a Lawrence Elkins is. Mm-hmm. They may only know who an Arthur Rhodes is. And that's okay. We've got a place for each one of those people in our golf tournament. So we're thrilled that that's still moving forward and trending in a really good direction for us. There will be one of the first big sports events in Central Texas that happens there. Yeah, that's always kind of Father's Day weekend, um, mid, mid-June. Things will, I think, just really kind of really be opening up then, Lord willing. Um, you, you usually have kind of an event, a dinner, you know, and, of course, the uh, auction items. It's a fundraiser. And so so is that still going to happen? Is it going to look the same way? This year will be different, yeah. and you're exactly right. The Friday night event has been very popular for so many. Sure. It's a great gathering opportunity back at the Hall of Fame where we'll have dinner and drinks and uh, an announcement of our uh, inductees and those other celebrities that are playing with us and then a big auction. Because we're not sure how social distancing and spacing will be, um, that's probably more than likely going to have to be an outside event. So whether we do that at Cottonwood Creek or whether we do that out on our front lawn there facing University Parks Drive, um, our subcommittee that handles our golf tournament is taking a very uh, hard look at that right now to determine what's best, to look at the governor's guidelines, to make sure that we're doing the right things. You know, for us right now in the hall, we can only have 25% of fire code capacity, which is 125 people. So we certainly couldn't do that event no, right no. now. We've had almost 500 
in the past for that event at the Hall of Fame. So we're trying to determine, you know, if we do that outside, how many uh, you know, cocktail tables can we have? How much distancing between people do we need to do? Just do tents or something to that effect open air or you know what we'd like to do is have a mixture of tents open mm-hmm. air and the museum open as well to try to take advantage of that if we don't the thought process being we could do something fun at the golf course maybe have a helicopter drop maybe have some <laughs> open air uh bar uh and drink areas for folks to go and enjoy refreshment as folks are coming off the course with the understanding that people are understanding this year has been different for all of us and this is going to be a different uh, Bob Lilly celebrity golf tournament than we have ever had in our 26 others that he has been associated with. I think people are going to be, and we're going to ask people to be patient. And I think people will understand that this will be a little bit of a one-off year for us. Well, if COVID has done anything, it has certainly uh, generated the creative juices on, you know, how to, how to, how to come up with another way to hold an event or. Right. It, it, it make it puts you in a position where you do have to think outside the box. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, of all the bad that has come of this, and there has been, you know, starting with, uh, with death, the fact that we've had to take a look and think more strategically. And as you've mentioned, to, to pivot in a way that maybe we wouldn't have to do. Sometimes you can get stayed and very much in a rut in terms of running events. And if something has like a, a, a golf tournament of this capacity going on for 26, 27, 28 years, it's easy to, to get in a funk. It's easy to do the same thing over and over again. This has caused us to, to really take a step back. And as I mentioned, pivot and look at some new things to not only attract celebrities, but to keep people comfortable and make them feel safe when they come out. Well, and and of course, another income stream for the Sports Hall of Fame is the fact that you rent out the space for, you know, receptions and parties and so forth. You don't really have any direction quite yet on that, how that's going to go. Absolutely. We're, yeah. We have between 70 and 75 events a year that happen at the Hall of Fame. And obviously the end of school year is a very busy time for mm-hmm. us. And so that was a, a, a big gut punch to our budget. Um, and we don't have a way to make that back up. But what we want to do is be in a position that as we get guidelines from the federal and state and even local level as to what is um, appropriate, uh, we want to be ready. And so um, as we stand right now, we have some really unique features at the Hall of Fame. We've gone to a completely touchless gift shop. I've never seen that before. Explain how that works. And so as you mentioned earlier, we've had to start thinking outside the box. One of the things that we heard back from the CDC guidelines is when little Johnny comes into a normal gift shop, he touches the shirt, then he oh, touches sure. the candy bar, then he wants the Baylor mini helmet. Uh, and now, Mommy, I would like that Coca-Cola. Well, those are four different touch points where there's a possibility of transmission. And so what we've looked to do is take that space of about 3,500 square feet, and we've moved that behind stanchions. And now basically our gift shop manager is the one that you can walk in and behind safety plexiglass, he says, what can I help you with? You can see all of our items, but not be able to touch them right now. And so what it's allowed us to do is for individuals that come to the Hall of Fame to have a comfort level with that. But again, something unique. We're talking talking about events here. It's just another change that we've had. We anticipate that we'll start at some point, maybe later this summer, hosting events. But even then at 125, they're not all going to be able to sit together. What does that look like? And so it will be fascinating as the summer blends into the early fall, what that new reality for us will be. We don't know. We can only anticipate, but we just don't know. Well, it is a, it's a wonderful place to go visit. And, um, as as somebody who works there, you're around it all the time. You know, I I know that there are a lot of people in central Texas who live here and have not come to see the sports hall of fame. So, so what, what is your pitch to them that they need to come? What do they need to see here? When I first took over, I was I was someone who had lived in Texas previously, but I'm not a native Texan. I, I grew up in the state of Georgia. And so I was thrilled just to get to walk through as someone who participated in sports at several different levels. And, and what was unique to me was the breadth of the collection. We have over 13,000 artifacts, of which 8,000 are out. We have 7,000 we can't even show people. Our building is not busy, big enough to physically house our entire exhibit. But of those 8,000 items, we go anywhere from women's golf and men's rodeo to college and professional football and everything in between. And one of the areas that's unique for us is within our Hall of Fame, you'll find as many people standing in front of the Labonte Brothers NASCAR exhibit as you will the Troy Aikman <laughs> exhibit. And that's what's unique is that we have not we have been purposeful and not just focused on football or men's basketball. It is a it is a museum and a hall of fame for the people of the state of Texas. And one of the unique factors, if anyone wants to come and see things, we, we are as unique as having replica green jackets from Augusta National from both Jackie Burke and Jimmy DeMeritt. We have a Heisman Trophy dating back to the 1930s. But the thing that I love the most, if you come in about five years ago, Nolan Ryan shut down his museum just outside of Houston and Alvin. And he has loaned us his entire collection. So it is all six no-hitter balls. 
It is his, it is his World Series and his Hall of Fame rings. But what's unique is the thing that I love most in our exhibit, it is the scout card from when he was an 18-year-old high school pitcher for the scout from the New York Mets that came down and found him. And it's fascinating to see someone who went on to have the acclaim. And as I think of Texas sports legends, if Nolan's not at the top of that class list, it doesn't take very long to call the roll. There's not many others. <laughs> Nolan's up there to see what someone thought of an 18 year old Nolan Ryan and to understand through that, that scout's eyes, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. It gives me chills to think about that. That's what a hall of famer is. And so I hope people, and we've got those across almost every sport. Uh, and so I hope people will come in and see that exhibit or the one that focuses on a Mia Hamm or the one that focuses on a Babes Harris uh, or Rudy Tomjanovich. Um, we've got a tremendous history there. And so I hope people will come out and see it. For those that have seen it, we've made additions over the years. So if you haven't been out come in a while, come back out and see us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, any rules for the road when folks come? It, it is a brand new world for us yeah. that, that is so different. And so one of the things that we were able to do is we have had a professional cleaning company come in. Um, we were allowed to open up in early May, and I specifically chose for us not to do that. I wanted people to be able to come in and not only enjoy their experience, but to know that they'd be safe and healthy when they did that. So we've had that cleaning. Our staff has been tested to make sure that they're not sick on a daily basis. We send anyone home that has any um, issues in terms of high fever. So when folks come in, they know that one, that facility has been closed since early March. We haven't had traffic. Before we opened, we had a professional deep cleaning. And then every 60 minutes, all of our high traffic areas from our restrooms to our high touch point areas are cleaned. And so we encourage people to wear masks or gloves. They don't have to. They can certainly come in as they will, but our staff is. And so we anticipate around June 1st, we'll see some relaxing of restrictions. Um, again, our biggest area right now, 90%, 92%, I think, of our museum is open. So a couple of the areas that folks wouldn't get to see right now are the fight songs. You can come in and pitch any one of the 25 or 30 different Division One university fight songs. We've obviously taken that down. Our water fountain we've had to take down. Mm. Um, and then some of the other areas, we have an interactive exhibit but that's down for the time being. As we get some confirmation from the state and local level that those are safe, we'll open those back up and we anticipate, if not June 1st, sometime in June. Well, it's a temporary thing. I think everybody agrees with that. It has uh, thrown a monkey wrench into a lot of great plans and not the least uh, of which the induction banquet, yeah. but it's exciting to know that, that that's on the horizon. That's right. And uh, as they say in the business, stay tuned for that. <laughs> but uh, Cooper, thank you so much for speaking. So if, if somebody, you know, just wants to donate some money to you, how can they do that? And we'd love to have that happen. <laughs> if not, if not as simple as calling uh, 756-1633, they're always welcome to come to our website sure. at yeah. tshof.org. And on our website, we've got a, uh, a tab that folks are able to give at. And so we encourage folks that want to continue to promote and protect and preserve the history of sports in the state of Texas. Um, you know, at this point in time, donations and generosity are as needed as they ever are. And so for those folks that understand the role that sports plays in the state of Texas and the history of the state of Texas, we appreciate that and welcome individuals to, to reach out to us and let us know if they'd like to help. Oh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Cooper, for being with us. Texas Sports Hall of Fame. It's just uh, easy to find right there on University Parks Drive. And thank you so much for having me. Always wonderful to visit with you. Good, you too. What's the one thing people always say they wish they still had after a disaster or fire? Photographs. Revision Photo Restoration is dedicated to helping preserve and restore your memories. Take advantage of this extra time you have at home to go through those old boxes of photos. If you're feeling overwhelmed by the process, follow them on Pinterest for organizational tips and tricks for old photos. They have on-site fire and weatherproof storage facilities to ensure the safety of your images, so you don't have to ship off all your memories to a larger company. Revision can handle everything from slides and negatives to film and prints. Revision Photo Restoration is local to Waco and located at 2001 Franklin Avenue. Call 254-297-9754 for an appointment or instructions on how to send in files digitally. Revision Photo Restoration. Check them out on Instagram at Revision Photo. guide 
through Waco. I'm here to tell you all the goings on in and around Waco. I'm going to give you the 411 on what's happening, what's going on, and what events you should go to. This is your host, Debbie, signing off. Now that you know, go. Just go, Waco. As churches and other civic gatherings are slowly beginning to gear back up, there are a lot of questions about group singing, and especially for congregational worship and choirs and things like that. So joining me now, Lauren Weber, who is lecturer of theater and musical uh, theater in specializing in voice at Baylor University, uh, recently saw you on a webinar through Truth Seminary, in fact, talking about this very thing. Uh, now, you describe yourself as a voice science nerd. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Well, so so you really study, you know, the the use of voice um, with this COVID nineteen thing. I, I'm as a as a choir member, as a singer, I'm just in in grief right now because I really think it's going to be a long time before choirs get together and sing like we've been used to. Yeah, it is, and it is. Um it w- the news has not been what I would hope it would be um, as a practitioner, as a singer, as a choir director, a music director. Um, yeah, it's it's not great. We're what we call super spreaders. So that's uh, singers have trained for this. I was going to say that's what <laughs> projection, you know. Exactly. Well, yeah. In fact, you, you were saying uh, in, in the webinar that, you know, we're thinking six feet for, right. you know. Typical interactions. Right. I think six feet. Right. Um, the so I've been doing just, I, I love to read all things voice science and vocology, and there there are new studies coming out, but right now, um, it looks like maybe more like 12 to 16 feet for singing, because we can just really uh, get those aerosols moving, which is quite unfortunate. Anybody that sat on the front row of a show, though, probably has gotten some stage spit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> at, at some point, and so it makes sense. Yeah, and you know, it's not just the spit or anything like that. It's just um, kind of the smaller particles and the way that things move. So the louder, um, you know, we've just seen some choirs in other parts of the country and the world that have met and had some really bad outcomes. So yeah, that was one of the one of the first stories really that came out of the COVID issue was I think it was in Washington or Oregon somewhere. And and, um, of course, the average age of the choir member, right. you know. These intergenerational choirs. There. Yeah. One of our favorite things is that we get to sing all together, but. Yeah, but but the, the older folks certainly are at risk. And, of course, they didn't, nobody knew anybody had. No, and the they came in with. with Clorox wipes. They brought their own music. They didn't sit super far apart, but they weren't, you know, the normal huggy selves um, as we can kind of become family in choir situations. Sure. So. Yeah, and and yet, you know, as you said, I think there two people even died from right, the yeah. from the virus at that point. Um, so so where does that leave us? Um, I know churches are just starting to figure out how to how to meet again. Congregationally, folks love to sing. You know, are they just going to not be singing? I don't know. It's so hard. Um, you know, there's some new research coming out. Even since Tuesday, there's some funding happening to actually do some singing specific um, research in a recital hall, um, so they can get really good numbers because a lot of the research in voice science, because we can't touch the voice, we can't really see it. No. It ends up being, a, a you know, kind of really interesting calculations um, with people way smarter than me that make them. But this will be really specific to that. I think that's going to be great and open up more. So if we can just do the best we can with what we know today, I think we'll know more as every week goes on. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I think each community has to look at what their numbers are, you know, wh- where they are, what their community looks like, because I don't think there's, you know, one right answer. But right now, I think we, what we do know is it's hard to be in a small space, enclosed, sitting right next to, you know, your your soprano friend and singing out. Right. So. And you're singing on top of somebody else. Right. Or maybe somebody is behind you, you know, the tenors are behind yeah. you, you know, blasting you out. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's just kind of the nature of, of choirs. Um, you also, you are a choir director at St. Paul's. Yeah, I correct? lead the music for the family service. We do some small choir stuff, a lot of children's music um, as well. And so, yeah, and thinking uh, there have been some reports saying that if they, when people do resume even, um, you know, putting the most at risk people at the back so that they're getting less exposure. I mean, there's some really interesting things. People are saying move outside and do rehearsals. There's there's no real safe things, but there are things we can do that make things better and safer for people. Yeah, and there has been a lot of creative um you know, effort gone into just the performances themselves. Uh, you know, we've seen these wonderful Zoom uh, videos 
of, uh, you know, different people all over the world, you know, as they're singing a particular song. It's The incredible. virtual choir is yeah. a whole new fad, I think. People are either <laughs> really into one? or not. I haven't, but I'm, I'm ready to. I think it's about time. So we did... Um, our cabaret performance. My colleagues put that on. I got to help do some of the editing of that because that's usually an in-person performance at Baylor. Sure. And um, so that was fun. We just did it in-house, but looking to other ways. I think some of that stuff will stick around. People enjoy being able to sing with choir members that have moved away, you know, in other communities. Um, I got together with one of my former uh, castmates of Les Mis when I did that back at the Civic Theater, and um, he's in South Carolina, and uh, Todd Blattman and I, we all did a little performance for the Unpack the House for Civic Theater, which was fun, you know, in our own little spaces. So there's been some really great creativity. Yes, um, I had a chance to uh, have Eric Shepard, you know, on the, yeah. early on in all this, trying just trying to figure out, you know, how do these um, different venues and, and uh, performing groups, how they are able to, you know, continue. Yeah, and I think it'll be an interesting next step, you know, just doing the best that we can. It's hard it's hard for those of us that cope with pl- by um, stress by planning to know what <laughs> happens next, right? I love to have everything planned out. Oh, no. <laughs> so but we kind of have to take it one thing at a time and um, figure out what we can do for the next step. So I know Civic's looking into that. Baylor, everyone's kind of figuring out what that's going to mean. Yeah, and just the technical aspect of that. Um, <laughs> one of the one of the early Zoom meetings we had, you know, we were. Everybody was was on their mics. were all on, and everything. Like, well, let's try to sing this. It was <laughs> it was horrible. We are not going to try that again. When as a choir director, if you're having if you're leading a Zoom choir rehearsal, now everyone has to mute, so you don't get any feedback, right? So you're right, you're right. kind of doing these things, and I hope they sound great at home. It reminds me a lot of directing <laughs> choral directing class in college. So, so how do they? I mean, really, let's go through this. So so how do they record it? How do they get that? So for that the, individual's voice. For the virtual choirs, there's a couple of different ways. So the, mm. the um, some people are sending individual audios back and then actually lip syncing on Zoom. So <laughs> they are <laughs> okay because it's the easiest way to edit it, and then we can see everyone at the same time. Yeah, That's a little insider secret. Um, there are other apps and um, higher technology that will let you overlay videos and vocals, but it does become a whole new skill, right? Like. Not every choir director can take on this new technological advanced skill set. Um, so people are helping each other out and sound designers are getting involved. And I've learned my fair share of iMovie since this all started. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about an, an actual, say, a worship service, and, you know, no matter what. I mean, usually there's there's hymns sung. So, um, you know, rather than the choir, I know in the, the setup in some more traditional churches, I mean, it's set up to where people are really close to close together as opposed to spread out um so you you think it's going to be more you know one singer on a mic kind of a kind of a canter kind of a thing or yeah it's hard to say you know in some sanctuaries they can really spread out singers pretty uh, much further than like uh saint paul's my church is just a long thin very you know old historic church not much space um for that and then the congregational seating even as they're social distancing people it's not going to be 16 feet i mean that would take a whole football field to do the listeners require right we have to think about that so i'm hoping that music stays uh in some way you know i've got some like i think there might be a resurgence of handbell choirs or i I heard you say that i thought (laughs) yeah that Right, because the handbell choir, I've kind of fallen out of That's fashion. Right. But, uh, you can easily space yourselves out. And, you know, I mean, just some fun ways to yeah. keep the music going. A, um, a woodwind playing the hymn, you know, along or things like mm-hmm. that. But they, they are discouraging congregational singing right now and, and choral singing just because as people um, increase in volume and increase in uh, sustaining, you know, singing is an extension of speech. So as we can increase all these things, the more we're kind of spreading things further yeah even even more so um let's get to know you okay. <laughs> a little bit better you are from central texas right i am you know i'm uh moved to waco when i was two uh left for college and so i'd never moved back and here i am so <laughs> it's been, famous last word. that's right it's been great to come back i waco is a whole new place from when i left um there's so much you know more such a vibrant community uh and I think that's one of the hard things right now about the arts is uh, we're all kind of grieving, even as we're being creative in these other aspects. And I think Waco, I think, turned a huge corner. I think these um, advancements we made in the arts and just the community and the things that we can experience, I think they'll come back. I know they will. I know we will be not singing forever, right? This is temporary. (laughs) This is a temporary thing. But yeah, it's been great to be back here and it's a great place Mm -hmm. to raise a family. Well, you had an interesting training. I mean, you've You've uh, sung and, and worked in um, your education. Tell me a little bit about where, where all you've been. So I went to the University of Oklahoma for my undergraduate degree. Um, had to get out of Waco and did um, a BMA of 
uh, voice and then did uh, religious studies as my emphasis. And then I moved to Wyoming, which is one of the only places you can teach with your bachelor's at a college. Um, so <laughs> I started teaching at the collegiate level um, and was teaching voice to mostly theater students and thought, oh, I love this. This is really fun. Um, I'd done some musical theater, but it wasn't my you know, main interest. I'd done mostly classical voice. So I taught there for a while and then um, decided to get my master's of fine arts in musical theater. So I went to Minnesota State Mankato and while I was there, my voice teacher, uh, he was he was the opera director and I went and knocked on his door and I said, I'd like for you to teach me. And he said, I don't teach theater majors and shut the door. And I knocked on the door again and I said, how about I sing for you first? <laughs> and so Please, let me sing. Uh, I sang for him and he, he was like, will you be my opera? I said, I don't know, are you gonna teach me? So um, <laughs> I ended up doing a double master's. So I did a master's in music there as well. Um, and then taught in that program in the um, contemporary music program. So my, my emphasis is kind of in like vocology and functional voice training and how um, I think everyone, every style deserves good, healthy technique. Um, and this idea that, you know, I think classical technique is usually really good and healthy, but these changes that you adapt to different styles is kind of my specialty and what I find really fun. That's fascinating. Fascinating. Now at, at Baylor, you know, they've, they've had to make some huge cuts. I know in the budget, huge yeah. cuts. Um, and, and they're expecting maybe not as many students to come back in the fall. I mean, still kind of feeling our way along in your particular specialty where, you know, you are one-on-one with students and, and everybody is together in rehearsals. And what, what are you, what are you seeing for at least the near term? Yeah. Well, last I heard enrollment numbers are actually pretty good right now, which is great. And I think speaks volumes to kind of the care and attention we give our students. Um, my colleagues, I was so impressed at how quickly they adapted to moving. I'm hitting things, sorry, to You're moving fine. online. Um, they just did a great job of switching things over. You know, I was, I have a really high contact load because I teach one-on-one individual lessons. So I was moving to like close to 20 Zoom hours a week, which is just not the same as an in-person, you know, my extrovert <laughs> no. didn't feel quite this fed. Uh, but we did it. And I've been really inspired. The technology from February to now has just taken off. So the latency issues are a problem in teaching voice. And there are four or five different companies that have worked on like reducing those to an almost, you know, 20 foot away kind of sound as opposed to right now with the Zoom kind of issues that we have. So I'm really digging into that this summer because I think why not, right? This is so cool that we're on the cutting edge of this. And uh, one-on-one lessons will be easier to resume because we can get way far away um, than choral sure. singing. Yeah. But I want to know what this means in case we have a resurgence or something happens and we can't be, I want to be on the front of that. So that's been uh really fun to see and fun to see people adapt. And I think we're just moving forward. You know, I saw something that was like, we don't know much, what we know we can't tell you, make a plan. And I was like, that sounds about like what's <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> but you know, we're doing the best we can with that and yeah. staying positive. And in some ways it's, we're all in it together and it's so overwhelming. There's nothing else you can do besides mm-hmm. take it one day at a time. And remember why we're doing this, you know, that I want my students to become the best artists they can be. And that that's, that's not going anywhere, even if it looks different right now. They're getting new skills. We switched over to a whole online auditioning, which is what they need anyway. That's what they're doing now for first round in New York. So it pushed us to put out some great content about that. And, you know, sometimes it just keeps you moving forward. Yeah. And you've got some fabulously talented students at Baylor. Talented and smart and hardworking. I mean, I just, I've taught several places and Baylor, the students are Top, top, top bar. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, of course, it, it is a juried program. I mean, you'd go, oh, I think I'll be a music major at Baylor. Yeah. Yeah, and the theater <laughs> Maybe department. Maybe not. The audition for the theater department. The fun thing is, in my class, um, because I teach the freshman theater, they don't come in as musical theater. Mm-hmm. They just come in as theater. So I have students that are first chair all state, and I have students that have never sang karaoke in that same class in that first semester. And I enjoy both of them. I enjoy seeing just how far a student that has never really sang can come in a year and mm-hmm. then as they continue because they need to learn how to use their voice as their instrument regardless of, you know, where they're headed, if they're going to sing or just speak on stage. Mm-hmm. That super spreader has to keep practicing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sing out Louise. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always like to uh, get to know my uh, my guests a little bit better and have a few questions like uh, the ones the late James Lipton used to use on Inside the Actor Studio. Are you familiar with that? Yes. All right. So here we go. Uh-oh. This is my, my version. What's your favorite word? Oh, enthusiastic. Okay. Your least favorite word? Worry. Yeah. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Oh, passion. I'm supposed to give more than one word answer. Whatever, whatever <laughs> you want. Whatever, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what turns you off? Apathy. <laughs> You're very good at this. <laughs> okay, what, what sound do you love the most? Oh, my children laughing. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've got, tell us about your kids. Yeah, I have um, an 11 month old. She just took her first steps. So oh. it's been fun. The, we are crazy right now, you know, in, in this um, time, but it's been nice to be for all those moments. And then we have a four and a half year old, he's about to be five in preschool. And then we have a six year old who's going to go through kindergarten, ver- drive by graduation next week. Oh. So. <laughs> you've, got, you've got your hands full, though, for yeah. sure. Um, what sound do you not like? Oh, there's a lot of those. <laughs> Oh, probably snorting of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. all right. What other profession would you like to try? Oh, I, you know, as a kid, I wanted to be a veterinarian or fly airplanes. I thought both of those sounded really fun. Uh, my parents said I, I was way too social to be a pilot, that I would not really enjoy being in a cockpit and just not, they were probably right. Um, but I don't know, now, I, I really like people, so... I think event, I could do event management type stuff. I really like, you know, anything that's kind of getting people together, which is unfortunate, I guess, in <laughs> our current what climate. That's <laughs> what we're not doing right now. Yeah. All right, so what job do you know you would not want to do? Oh, anything like math in a room by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think of myself as much of, an, much of an extrovert, but these questions are making me think maybe I am. <laughs> okay, so last one. What do you want to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates, Lauren? Oh. Probably just welcome. Yeah. Yep. Another that's, another voice in the choir. Yeah. <laughs> our, our heavenly choir. That's right. <laughs> oh, Lauren, thank you so much. This is um, so fun. I mean, it, it helps a lot. There's a lot of grieving that some of us who, you know, are realizing how things have changed, but um, it's a season. That's right. That's right. And there's good things that come from all seasons. Yeah, so that's right. Well, yeah. I... Do appreciate so much you taking time to be with us. Well, Lauren thanks Weber. for having me. So fun to be here. Yes. Central Texas Living is part of the Rogue Media Network family. Be sure to check out their other shows at roguemedianetwork.com. Please rate us five stars on iTunes and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Join us again soon for more Central Texas Living, the podcast. This has been Rogue Media Network Podcast.